Oh, so many questions. We'll take that one. Are we smart enough yet to figure out how big or huge the universe is? Oh, sort of. Um, <laughs> we know how big the observable part is. We've got the age, and we can say, well, we can see 13.75 billion light years in every direction. So it's 27.5, I guess, uh, total diameter that we can see. Uh, but that, on the other hand, we say, if you were standing out there, what would it look like? And somebody out there would say, oh, I think it's 26.7 billion light years diameter from where they're standing. So we imagine that it's actually infinity. But we can't tell. You cannot observe infinity. Oh, uh, there. I'm, okay, you said that there uh, hasn't been any center proven of the universe. And there was a theory that uh, not only when the Big Bang happened did uh, matter go out, but also uh, space itself expanded. And so you really wouldn't have a uh, center. The center was the uh, current universe. Yeah, that's, that's what I was trying to say when I said the horrendous space kablooey is a better name. Yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly what you said. Is there anything you can say about what happened before the Big Bang? And is there anything you can say about uh, the claim is that everything is determined, that everything was sort of baked in at the time of the Big Bang, determinism. And is there anything you can say about that with regard to free will? Okay, my golly, there's two very different questions there. <laughs> Well, the first question is, uh, what's there before the Big Bang, or how did this uh, occur? And uh, a few years ago, we would have been pretty sure that the answer was the universe started with a singularity, uh, that there was just nothing before that. Uh, now we don't think that. Uh, it's been proven that there are ways to avoid that particular extreme infinity. And so now we say, well, what if there were a, some uh, substrate universe, maybe in 11 dimensions or something, and it just has quantum mechanics or whatever the new thing will be going on and it erupts and makes universes. So that could be. Uh, it could even be that uh, the universe that we have is one of many and uh, that ours will go out and collapse or that others are going out and collapsing again. And uh, we probably could never tell, but we might have a good story. Uh, about your other question about is, are things uh, determined from the beginning? Uh, that's also a hard story, but uh, I think uh, the question of whether we have free will is more a matter of point of view than it is uh, physics. You know, if, if I believe that every motion of every atom and molecule in my body is predetermined, it still doesn't mean that I know what it's going to do. I don't know what I'm about to say before I say it. So, um, and I, I think that's where people have run into trouble. They, th they think there's a scientific answer to whether there's free will, and that's really a matter of what's the definition of free will. Uh, way in the back. Um, at the facility in CERN in Switzerland, uh, there were news stories a little bit about the possibility of black holes being formed and that that was a hazard. Uh, could you expand on that? Yeah. Um, the question was whether it was safe to turn on this, this particle accelerator. Would, we, would a black hole be made that could swallow the Earth? That was the sort of extreme version. Um, the scientific answer to that, which the judge believed, was that nature does this all the time. There are much more energetic particles made in the, in the sky by natural processes, uh, and uh, if they were going to make black holes that swallowed the universe, it would have already happened. So the conclusion was it's safe to turn it on, and sure enough, nothing bad has happened yet except uh, blowing up magnets. So, there we go. Is there necessarily one Big Bang, or could there be multiple Big Bangs with a sort of recycling effect? Oh, um, so you're asking partly about does it go out and come back? Um, sort of black hole. Yeah, um, it could be. Um, we don't know why it's currently accelerating, so that means we also don't know why, whether to predict that it will stop accelerating and turn around. Uh, at the moment, it sort of looks like it's not going to turn around this time. But it doesn't mean that it didn't collapse from a previous thing previous cycle beforehand. Maybe there was this cosmic crunch that came before the great expansion. Uh, and so there are th pretty sound mathematicians working on this kind of idea. And in particular in the uh, story of multiple dimensions, you can say, well, what if 
there are two surfaces in this higher dimensional space and they sort of come together and then they go apart again. And the, the, the way they think about it, that event looks like a Big Bang to us in our small number of dimensions. So if they go about, well, they could move any way they like. You know, we don't know. So I think it's just possible. And again, it's going to be really hard to tell from measurement because they all come out explaining what we've already seen. Otherwise, we don't like the theory. Right, yeah. <laughs> Is this the M theory that the grand design is Yeah, I right think now? it's the M theory. Yeah. Is that the multiple? Div- I, I guess I don't understand yeah. it. So. That's another way of naming this story about the strings. Okay. The things where I said a point has to be a thread or something. You could have a, instead of a thread, how about a sheet or something? Is that, is that the letter M? M, yeah. M is in yeah. membranes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, in the back. Uh, I have a question about W map. You know, you said it's about measuring about five degrees Kelvin. So is it cooling off over time so oh. that it wouldn't be measurable? And oh, um, what's happening to the temperature of the Big Bang radiation? Yeah. It diminishes as the universe expands. It turns out the expansion um, size times the temperature of the radiation is a constant. So when the universe is twice as big, the temperature will be half as big. And uh, we cannot measure that. We speculate, but we cannot possibly measure that. It's too slow. On the other hand, we are able to measure, to make remote measurements of the universe's temperature. There are little molecules out there that we can see how the macrowaves were acting on them. So indeed, the early universe was hotter. We can measure that. Let's move to maybe three more questions. Okay. Is that so, okay with you? I, I, I've heard uh, one, one thing that you, you skipped over was the period of inflation mm-hmm. uh, shortly after the Big Bang. And what I understand is that one of the things that led to folks to think that inflation occurred is that the geometry of space is very flat. How does an, astron- an astronomer measure the geometry, ah. flatness or curvature of space? Right. Uh, of course, we don't directly do it. Uh, when the curvature was uh, conceived as an explanation, people actually went out to mountains and tried to measure whether the sum of angles of a triangle was 180 degrees, uh, and they couldn't tell uh, that it was different. So uh, we also don't do that. Uh, but what we can do is uh, uh, deduce what the properties of the universe must be to explain the, spe- the speckles on the map. Um, so um, a lot of different lines of evidence say that the universe is geometrically flat. Uh, which means not that space isn't, space time is still curved according to Einstein. Uh, but if you take a slice of the universe, all the places that are 13.7 billion years after the explosion, that's a surface in three dimensional space. And so if you now measure in that space, those, it is indeed flat, it's not curved. And the, the explanation we have for that is it used to be curved, but the expansion has stretched the curvature out so far that you can't see it. So if you take a small balloon and you can see that it's curved and then you blow it up really, really big and you can still only see a tiny piece of it, now now you think it's flat. Okay. Uh, you, you quoted uh, Plato, uh, Aristotle and Plato. Plato's allegory in the cave says what you see depends on, its point of, on your point of view. An extension of that is the map is not the territory. Uh, uh, Take into the case, case that you fit it all the t- that every observable thing fits your equations. Uh, does that uh, may, does that necessarily mean that uh, uh, that's how it is? Uh, for example, a, a quadratic equation as compared to an n-dimensional uh, 200 variable equation has two, two solutions, and you pick the one that fits your intuition. Are we, maybe, that M theory and string theory fit that way, and, uh, and everything else fits the way I observe, but that may not be where the universe knows how it works, and there may be something underlying. Is there anything that you've seen that says that that may be what's going on? Um, so you're basically asking, would we know if we'd ever found the right story? Yeah. And I think the answer is we might guess it, but we probably can't prove it. Uh, Because as you say, uh, there's probably more than one way to explain everything we've found. Uh, In fact, when inflation was first invented, I thought, well, those those guys just made it up to explain what we already know. It's pretty wild. 
And so my fellow astronomers thought, oh, that's nuts. It turned out the uh, particle physicists had plenty of reason to think that it was true no matter whether, whether the astronomers saw anything or not. So um, the, the particle people wanted that. And so Alan Guth is a very famous guy because his idea fell on receptive ears. Astronomers that had proposed similar things, nobody wanted to hear them because there were precursors. People wrote before Alan Guth did about inflation. Nobody believed it. I was wondering if you could talk about the um, supergalactic structures, the wall and the attractor. Yeah, a little bit. Um, he's asking about the, how are galaxies arranged. Uh, and uh, if you uh, just said, well, the universe is randomly filled with specks of pepper, uh, you would not see patterns. But what's been happening, apparently, is that gravitation acting over the course of time has pulled together galaxies into, crowd, into clouds. And in fact, uh, it's a little worse than that. Uh, it works that uh, dark matter did that first. Dark matter was able to move even before ordinary matter could move. So there are clouds of dark matter out there, and they pull ordinary matter in, and then we see the galaxies. So all of this is now possible to simulate in the supercomputers, and uh, we have amazing movies of the formation of the structures of where the galaxies actually are located. So indeed, we get these clouds of hundreds and thousands of galaxies together, and then we get empty spaces. And it sort of looks like the structure of a sponge with uh, surfaces where there's a high density of material and then big holes where there's nothing. And uh, if you had told us that was how it was uh, before the computers came along and the dark matter was invented or discovered or whatever we call it, uh, we would all have been shocked. Nobody knew how to do this because we, we, we were able to observe the fact that these structures exist, but we couldn't figure out how they got there until the computers came along. Thank you, thank you.